Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Tour Design Process Basics for Beginners and Students, presented by Lauren Sego. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Lauren Sego, the presenter for today's webinar. While studying theater lighting design at CalArts, Lauren began her career operating eSports streams. Since graduating in 2016, she's provided lighting design and programming for music tours, festivals, and TV appearances by Janelle Monet, Tegan and Sarah, Revolution, and others. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Lauren. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Cool. We'll try to figure out this annotation thing. <laughs> it keeps popping up a little bit, but, um, but I'll try to work on it if I can. So good morning, everybody. Hi. Um, I kind of want to just dive right into it so we can get to questions at the end. Um, so I want to talk about the mental preparation when you're going into designing a tour. Um, really just has to do with any mental blocks, anxiety, um, any lower feelings like that when you're uh, starting to assess the process and throughout it. You know, maybe more of like the boring logistical parts to follow that. So gathering the information about the artist and the creative team. So getting to learn who you're going to be talking with throughout the design process. Maybe you're working with the creative director or just working with the artist directly or maybe you're all on your own and you have full creative control. Uh, we'll talk about logistical preparation. So, you know, the size of the trailer or the semi or how many semis or, you know, just more logistical things like that, any limitations. Um, then we'll get into the design process, um, how to present your design to your client. And then I'll go and talk about four uh, real life tour design scenarios that I've been through in the last couple of years. Um, so I really wanted to put this slide first. I think it's really, really important to note. Um, I have conversations about mental health during the design process all the time with fellow designers. Um, a lot of things can get in the way and can cloud your mind when you're designing. Um, these are all things that I experience pretty much every time. So some things I experience, um, I sometimes compare what I'm creating to other designers I know and admire, and I put myself down. Um, I feel really inadequate if I have like no good jumping point to jump off of uh, with a with a an idea. Um, struggling to find a process pattern, and by that I mean uh, the more you design, the more you might think like, oh, okay, you know, I'll the first step to designing is I'll do this, and then I'll do this, and I'll do this. It's going to change every single time. Every single design process is super unique, so don't think that it's going to be the same every time. Um, and then this is the biggest one for me is uh, taking budget restraints, venue restraints, uh, transportation restraints, things like that, and thinking that you can't show off your unique talents in the design because of these. Um, so, you know, just remember that you're super valid in all of your concerns, but you're also not alone if you have uh, any struggles during the design process. So get used to being uncomfortable, I guess. <laughs> cool. So the beginning stages. Um, Who's going to be involved in the process with you? So who hired you, first of all? Um, is it the tour manager? Is it the artist manager? How do they get to know you? Um, really try to establish a really good relationship with them first. Um, trust is super important with your client. Um, do you have direct or indirect communication to your artist? I've had it both ways. Um, I've had it to where I've had the artist's phone number and their email, and every time I had a question, I was able and free to contact them directly or I would contact the artist manager and they would be the liaison between me and the artist or the artist just doesn't care <laughs> uh, and is leaving all the creative up to um, their team or to you. Uh, again, that changes every time. Um, it's going to be different. Uh, is your artist interested in being involved with the process or is it up to their team? So I kind of did just say that I've had it to where I've had a full creative team, meaning a creative director, a choreographer, and the artist all involved. We sit together at a big round table and you know, try to brainstorm ideas together. I've also just been handed a production design that the artist and their team have created and I have to develop around it. 
Um, and I've also had experiences where the artist has no idea what they want, doesn't have a team, and they said, here, Lauren, have fun, which is typically the hardest one for me because uh, there's so much creative control and so many opportunities that I can, I can assess. What are the communication and sharing preferences of your team? I have some people that are just constantly wanting to talk to me on the phone about it. Um, others want to keep it strictly on email. But, you know, it all depends, but try to figure out soon on how you want to share and relay documents and information, if they like Dropbox or Drive, stuff like that. Just try to keep everything super organized and don't let them have edit preferences if you don't want them to accidentally delete your work. Um, so here are some questions to ask your creative team as you're getting involved. Um, and these are a few examples. You're going to have many more, I'm sure. Um, are there any reference photos or videos of past shows that I can see? So this first question I think is super important if you've never worked with the artist before. Um, I've had some artists where maybe their manager or tour manager or somebody will tell me, oh, they're super, super active on stage, all over the stage, and, you know, maybe they just kind of stick to their small downstage center portion the whole time. Um, so references are super important, even if you're creating a whole new production from scratch. Um, is there a story or a flow to the production that I need to be aware of? Um, what's the setting and is there a production design reference I can see? Um, when you're starting out doing tour designs, at least for me, I was given some productions where they only really had me hired to come in and create the world on stage. So I kind of ended up doing a little bit more production design than I thought I would, which I was really excited about. Um, so, you know, get ready for that opportunity. Um, what are some show elements I should be aware of? Do they have dancers? Are there props? Um, is there an intermission in the show? I've had that recently. Um, any instrumentation solos, voice solos, um, kabuki drops, anything like that. Kabuki drops, if you don't know, are basically those giant fabric curtains that you can release and drop, and usually they're downstage, and so when you drop them, you can release uh, and, and reveal the band behind. Um, haven't toured with that yet, but I think that'd be pretty fun. <laughs> um, is this tour representing a certain album or musical selection from the artist? So, you know, there's just a few questions to get you started, but don't be afraid to ask questions when you finally get to that round table or into that email. Um, and then also just shout out to my Janelle Monet team. They're a great group of people to work with. That was a fun tour. Um, so here are some examples of requests you might hear from the team that you're working with. Uh, please keep the artist lit from the front at all times to ensure being seen in photos. I have some artists who, no matter what at what point in the show, it doesn't matter, as long as they are lit, for the photographers to see them, they're happy. Um, reduce the amount of fixtures on the ground to maximize performance space or um, side light inc being incredibly important to light the dancers. Um, we really want some fog machines for this song. You know, it could be as simple or as complex, um, kind of an art that you have to perfect over the years <laughs> as you get to talking with different artists all the time. Um, I, the second paragraph here is super important. If your artist is incredibly lenient and is giving you full control, still make sure to ask them questions and keep them updated along the way. Um, so you might add an element that they've never seen before, even if they're thinking, ah, you know, I'm hiring them, they got it. Um, maybe you want to do something that they really haven't seen and maybe they want more of it or none of it. Who knows? Um, whatever the scenario, it is your artist's show and it's your job to make their dream happen. Uh, so after meeting with your creative team, it's really, really important to remember that your crew, your production crew, is just as important as this team when going through the design process. Um, this is something I'm just, I've been learning really heavily over the last year, working with really, really good crews on these bigger shows as my career tends to develop. Um, so your production manager, tour manager, and the crew that you're touring with, um, they need to be aware of the artistic integrity as well as the functional integrity of the design. Um, depending on their role, it's also their job to help you execute the design every day and keep it as consistent as possible. Uh, you don't want to have a design that is so hard to recreate every day, depending on the venue, that you can't keep it consistent, because then your artist is going to get annoyed that they're not getting what they're paying for every day. And they're also around to help make sure you get it packed up safely if you're also on the tour with them. Um, so getting to know who will be in your, your department every day is also super important. So maybe you're just the only lighting person on the tour, so you're 
you are responsible for loading in and programming and running the show and packing it up, or maybe you have a crew chief. Um, but that's going to help you design something that you know is being capable of built every day um, with your team size. So I've never built something or designed something so extravagant that I know that if worse comes to worse, I couldn't do it with like myself and a couple stagehands. Um, so keeping your crew updated also means keeping an open mind to structural or, or logistical suggestions. I definitely, when I was starting out, was really stubborn because I felt that I knew what was best as the LD. Um, leave it to like one truck driver one time to walk in and say like, oh, hey, have you tried it this way? And I was like, oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> so keep your mind open. People, um, you know, you might think you're getting overstepped, but sometimes people are just trying to help. And, you know, maybe your truck driver walks on stage and helps you reduce three rigging points that you don't need. So this one can also be really annoying or really helpful to you. Um, talk to the crew members who have their setups on stage, the roles on stage, like the guitar tech, wardrobe, you know, there are these pods around around your performance space um, uh, where your crew is going to need areas like walk-ons, walk-offs, um, all that kind of stuff. You know, maybe you really, really want to design an element to the show that needs to exist perfectly downstage, right? Um, but sometimes you need to make that compromise in case that needs to be a very specific walk-on, walk-off for your artist. Um, so have some contingency plans in your design. And then just a pro tip um, that I still sometimes forget to do myself, but as soon as you come in contact with a new person, save their number and information immediately. Uh, every time I get an email from somebody new, I check their email signature, I save their number, I save their name, I save their business, their position, all that information because I have sometimes seen an unknown number come up and I don't answer it and I wait for a voicemail and it turned out to be a really important call that I had to take right then. So just get that info in your phone really fast. Um, so now going on to logistical preparation, everyone's favorite thing, budget. Um, so there are some less obvious ways a budget can affect you other than thinking lower the budget, the less stuff you get or the more money you have, the more stuff you can get. Um, this is something I learned very soon on. Acknowledge the necessities and requests by your artist when looking at the budget. Um, prioritize all these necessities and requests first. Um, I have too often in the first couple years spent time designing, getting really excited about a design, only to realize I didn't weigh the cost of the most necessary parts and I had to cut back and cut back and cut back and cut back. Um, could have easily been avoided if I had a priority list. So continuing on budget. Um, so most of the time, budgets for smaller tours usually include an emergency funds portion, meaning, you know, any additions, repairs, mistakes on the road, you're like, oh crap, we need this today, that kind of money, you know, just some, uh, just that extra little pool of cash. Um, so it's really, really important to ask if your budget includes that fund. Um, Sometimes, or like my first tour I designed, I met the budget perfectly, thinking I was awesome for doing that, not realizing I needed to order more haze halfway through the tour. And they were like, oh, what do you mean we have to order more haze throughout the tour? I was like, sorry. Um, so just always be prepared to have a little bit of wiggle room. Um, <laughs> this one is great. Figuring out how to accommodate every request of the artist and keep the design in the budget is an art that you will be experimenting with your whole career. And I know I've seen some friends in the participant list who are watching this who have been designing way longer than me can totally attest to that. Um, so if your artist is asking for more than they can afford, try your best to say, like, I believe there's a way we can still accomplish this that fits within the budget, and I will send you some options. Um, so try to, you know, it's good to be honest with them. You don't want to promise them things that you cannot bring to the table, um, but let them know that you are trying. And then depending on the place you rent your gear from and your scenic elements from, um, you should be able to budget for spares pretty easily. Sometimes they just include spares for free or super, super low, so it might not affect your budget too much. But things like backup consoles, spare projectors, things that are maybe a little bit more expensive do add up really fast and you are gonna want spares for your show. So make sure that you shoot under the budget. Makes everyone happy. Um, so design fees. Um, so what should I consider before naming my design fee? Um, 
it's a possibility that the budget also includes a design fee. Um, your artist might not even have thought about giving you a design fee. It just happens. You know, you're going to, especially when you're just starting out, you're going to be working with artists who have probably never had an LD before. So they're not really sure how to tackle that payment. They're probably thinking, oh, they're just going to come to rehearsals and program and I'll pay them the weekly rate. That's kind of how I did it the first couple of times because I wasn't really sure how to even ask for a design fee. Um, and of course, designing means the creative research that you're doing, the drafting and the rendering, um, change fees. If you design something and they really, really like it and then last minute, they don't want anything <laughs> that you've made and you have to change all of it. So you have to prepare a number um, with wiggle room for yourself too. Uh, and it's always a good idea to create a contract or a deal memo saying, hey, if it exceeds this amount, this is how much I'm going to charge for these change fees. Um, the first time, the first few times you get design opportunities, you probably won't be promised a design fee, like I was saying. Um, it's best to decide, it's best for you to decide what's best for your finance situation. Um, I didn't take a couple design fees my first couple tours because I was more excited about the opportunity. Um, and I knew that I could grow with that artist and that touring camp later in life. Um, and it, you know, for me, it ended up really nice. I created really good relationships with these people, and for the tours I've designed since then, they've given, I've, I've presented my design fee, and they've been more than happy to pay me for it. Um, so remember, you might be the new person, but they also might be the new person to it. So it's always a learning experience, but definitely don't try to jip yourself. Try to create a design fee, see if you can get that covered. I personally take a percentage of the budget as my design fee, and then kind of alter from there, depending on how much time I think I'm going to spend on it. Uh, and that includes the creative research that I do. Um, so looking at venues, uh, this is a picture of the Ryman in Nashville. It's one of my favorite venues. I know that audio people do not like working there, um, but I really like it because it's one of the venues I can finally see my show from a higher seating area since front of house is way up in the back. Um, I don't like being at eye level with the stage when I program, so it's really fun going through there. Um, so hopefully your production manager will send you a venue list uh, way in advance uh, so you can kind of maybe help uh, massage your design into those spaces. Um, so what are the stage dimensions of the largest and the smallest venues in the routing? Um, if there's a huge difference between those sizes, you're going to have to create a design that can expand and contract pretty easily. Um, and remember to look for things like fire curtains. And when fire curtains are placed at the downstage portion of the stage, you cannot put anything in line with that. Um, ADA walkways, just common structural things that can get in the way. Um, what are the rigging capabilities like in most venues? You know, if you need a lot of soft goods hung, do they have line sets? Is it a theater? Do they have trust for your scenic, uh, your scenic elements? All that kind of stuff. Um, what are the sight lines like? Are there existing legs and borders um, and designated areas for changeovers? Or did you just walk into a giant room and you have to pipe and base up some, <laughs> some sight lines? <laughs> Uh, what are the house rigs like in each of these venues? Um, so are they going to be able to complete your design for you? Um, maybe you don't have the money to maybe necessarily design a, a, a flown rig in your package, and so, but you still want to have some programming in a flown rig. So if you can look at all of the um, all the house rigs and see if they're substantial enough to take that programming and do that for you, then maybe you don't have to prioritize flying any lights or having lights high on towers or something. Um, I have always created a venue spreadsheet if I haven't received one from someone else in my team first. Uh, I really like to know what I'm walking into. It still always changes, you know, like schematics and drafting can only get you so far. Sometimes, you know, you can look at something and then when you walk in, it, it changes. You know, it's completely different than what you thought in your plan. You have to, you have to, change it right then and just be really on the dot with that kind of stuff. And that's something that you'll grow with time too. Um, but the biggest thing is just remembering that continuity is the most important, again. Um, and you don't want to have a design that's too complicated that you constantly have to change it. Uh, so transportation. This is a picture of me in a trailer. <laughs> and my friend Shug, Shug Nasty, 
Um, he was the guitar tech on the Tegan and Sarah tour in 2017. We were the trailer pack gurus. Um, so you really need to know how your gear is getting transported. I know all this stuff sounds a little boring, but this is super important. I have had moments where I've had to cut back purely because I realized I didn't have trailer space and I had to leave lights at the venue after the first show because we didn't get a chance to pack it before and suddenly I've changed my programming. So, you know, ask your production manager, are we traveling with a semi, a trailer, a box truck, or even a van? How much of that space is allocated for me? Which bus is the trailer attached to is super important too. Um, because if it's not attached to your bus, maybe you're on a two bus tour, maybe all your stuff is on the artist bus and they're arriving a little bit later, you definitely wanna make sure you get your stuff on the right trailer. Um, and are you going to be sharing your truck space with another department? Um, and this tour specifically, it was a stripped down acoustic tour. So we had very minimal production and minimal backline and backline meaning instruments. So we actually fit everything in one trailer behind our bus and it worked really well. Um, and I'll actually talk about the design of this tour later. Um, so knowing road case dimensions and truck space is a really practical tool, um, but it's not something you're expected to know right away. I always ask my vendors for help with road case dimensions. Um, when I'm designing, I usually ask them to send me, hey, if I want all this gear, can you send me how many road cases per type um, uh, or like how many fixtures can fit in a road case? How many road cases will that be? What are the dimensions? And if and if I can do it before they can, I'll draw up a truck pack just to make sure I'm not shooting myself in the foot. Uh, and then the last of logistical preparation is reaching out to vendors. Um, so your vendor is obviously the company that's going to be going to be renting out their lighting package to you. Um, I always send out my rental list to multiple vendors. Um, it's a good way to start gauging rental costs and see where you can hopefully achieve renting all the gear you want without substitutions. Um, regardless of the relationship you have with some vendors, sometimes they don't want to sub-rent or rent gear from another shop to complete your package. Uh, I know that I've had some uh, some examples where I really want this one fixture. Actually, I really need this one fixture for my show. Um, and a buddy at this shop who I know would be able to cover me everywhere else is like, I'm so sorry, we can't get that available to you, so I have to go with another one. It's only personal, personal, but it's really important when you're contacting all these vendors to note that you are bidding the tour amongst multiple because you are creating a relationship with these vendors years to come. So even if you end up not going with the vendor, it's really important to say, you know, thank you for your time, I'll reach out again. Uh, consider routing when choosing a vendor. So if you're spanning a huge part of the U.S., it might be a good idea to choose a vendor that has multiple locations or is able to have quick turnaround times of shipping. Um, and also, again, just be open to vendors helping you out too. I've had many vendors say, hey, I see that you drew it like this. I think you're gonna reduce your truck space if maybe you use pipe instead of truss or something like that. Um, they're there to help you and make your pack fluid too. Okay, so now that we went through all of the less exciting stuff, <laughs> although personally, I love making venue spreadsheets. Um, so now we're gonna start talking about the design process. So laying out all the confines that I just shot through super fast. Um, take all the information you previously gathered and lay it out. So what are the necessary components to the design that have been requested by the artist and creative team? Prioritize those first, can't say it enough. Um, who's on my crew, meaning, who's on the lighting department or the just the general aesthetics uh, department, and who's leading this build with me, or am I doing it alone every day? Um, what's my budget and how much of that should I strive to use? What's my projected amount of hours I will spend on this process, meaning for your design budget, or sorry, your design fee? Um, what's my average venue size and what rigging specs should I be aware of to complete and make sure I can consistently execute my design every day? And then how much space am I allotted in the truck pack? So, oh, kind of this kind of goes with the mental health slide at the start. Sometimes starting is the hardest part. This is always the hardest part for me. I think I have a really strong left brain. When I have to get creative, I get I just shut down right away, and it's really really hard for me to know where to start. Um, and like I was saying earlier, the hardest part for me is when I have full creative control because I feel like I have all these opportunities I can juggle. 
and that makes it way more challenging. Um, so just remember that you're always going to find yourself in a unique situation with every design you do, no matter how many times you've designed before. Which is why I love this career, honestly. <laughs> it's something new every day. Um, so jump starting the creative process. Um, once you have everything laid out, time to lamp on the right brain. Um, so when and where do you feel the most creative? Uh, certain times of the day, at home. I personally somehow feel the most creative when I'm really tired, even though I'm not really a night person. I try to stay up super late, and I think it's because I'm forcing myself to get something out really fast so I can go to sleep. <laughs> um, do you have any current distractions around you, and how can they be easily eliminated? So this one I've learned just over the past year, and this has helped me immensely, um, to-do lists. So when I'm working on a design, obviously that's like the top of my to-do list, just not just for work, but in general, I want to work on that project. But sometimes I feel like I can't work on the big project if all the little other things on my to-do list are looming below me. So I try to get as many little things out of the way just so I can clear my head and just focus on the design that I'm doing. Um, and this is why I also work either really well right before bed um, in a comfortable place or during the day, I try to leave my house because I'm not distracted by personal responsibilities. Um, how do you gather creative inspiration? Do you research other designers or similar artists? Do you read or listen to audiobooks? Um, I actually really like listening to audiobooks uh, because it doesn't distract my eyes. Um, if I'm listening to music or listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something, I feel like I have more ability to alter what I'm thinking and have that inspire me to put it on paper. And then I'm, I'm not being persuaded by other visual elements. Um, do you work best with mood boards? I personally don't work really good with mood boards. I get frustrated, <laughs> um, but I know a lot of friends who like using those um, or collaging photos together. I do like doing that on Photoshop sometimes. I'll just take a lot of images that I think are, are um, uh, that represent kind of the idea that I'm leaning towards and I just kind of mash them together, honestly, and I try new things out. Um, uh, break down important elements in their most minimal shapes, colors, structures, and then expand, or the opposite. Um, do you write? Do you draw? You know, gathering the creative inspiration for uh, a process that's design and aesthetic related it doesn't always have to be shapes and colors and structures and things. You know, it can be words, it can be sounds, it can be some things in nature. You know, it doesn't always have to relate to what's in front of you on your computer. I've had plenty of um, Plenty of situations where I'll be on a hike and I'll look at, like this sounds so lame, but I'll be looking at the horizon and I'll get this amazing idea because of the shapes of nature. You know, you never know where you're going to find uh, find inspiration, so just keep your mind open. Um, so, time to start developing the design. Um, there's no right or wrong way to navigate the creative process. There's only your way. Um, so these are some questions to help get you started. Um, this, these kind of have to do with the, the last questions on the more aesthetic side and, and also the logistical side. Um, have you been granted any wiggle room from the rest of the team to alter the current production design to fit the lighting needs? So I've been given full renderings of production designs and they'll have some lights on it as an idea of what they want or they have no lights on it. And I think, oh my gosh, this is really cool. Um, but I don't know how I'm going to put lights on it. Uh, so ask if you can kind of recreate uh, their production design a little bit to kind of fit your needs and make sure everyone can can have a say in it. Um, after listening to the set list for the show, can you see if you need to diversify your rig to accommodate many types of songs and scenes? Um, how similar are the songs top to bottom? I've had some shows where it's just acoustic top to bottom, so it's more or less a little easier. I've also had some shows where it goes from like, Crazy, crazy Disney cover songs to like really, really sad piano solos. And so you have to like figure that balance out. That was a fun one I'll talk about later. Um, you know, there are a bunch of other questions on here. Feel free to take a screenshot. But um, the fourth one I try to think of uh, first really is the artist trying to make the audience comfortable or chaotic, impulsive, curious? Um, is your artist trying to create a relationship with the audience or are they? trying to really build that fourth wall and separate the production from the audience. Or do, do they want to watch a movie? 
or do they want to be in the experience with them or does it depend on the song? Um, I like to find the two most opposing songs in the set and come up with an environment to light the artist in each of them. So the environment meaning like either a stage design or a literal environment. Um, and that kind of helps me narrow down a couple different ideas. And trying to not uh, trying to not narrow it down to just a stage design really, really helps. Imagine if that artist was creating a music video, where would they be? It's kind of a good way to go around it. Um, listen to each song thoroughly and make a list of design choices you would think work well in each and try to find some consistencies and then use that information to help you jump off. Um, this is me hugging light. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about choosing fixtures, uh, I was really thankful I chose that fixture for that tour because all those venues were very, very cold and it was very, very warm and I was incredibly happy. Um, but don't pick fixtures because you know they'll keep you warm. Maybe you warm and fuzzy in your heart too, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, it's really overwhelming trying to choose fixtures. This is the hardest part for me. I feel like I have a way easier time designing the the bigger picture, the grand scheme of things, the full production. And then when it comes time to choosing fixtures, I'm just kind of like brain dead. Um, so the useful tip is to reduce the amount of fixture types on stage. And this is really important for a lot of the, um, a lot of smaller shows. Um, if you choose three to four fixture types max, it could mean a higher quantity of each and you're creating the illusion of more uniformity in a larger production instead of having 10 different kinds of lights on stage. It could look a little bit more messy, a little bit more crowded. Um, uniformity is a really good way to having a high quality look. Um, consider power consumption. Uh, so you might not have a ton of guest power in the venues that you're touring through. Uh, so maybe try to fix fixtures that are LED, lower power consumption. That way you can also travel with a smaller uh, power distro, a smaller PD it means more space in the trailer for more lights. Um, Look for hybrid fixtures. If you don't have a lot of money, hybrid fixtures are great because they can do some combination of spot, wash, beam, uh, and you can maybe just, I, I had, I've seen some tours where they've only had one or two fixture types on stage, but that one main fixture type they use everywhere was, was the same one, but it was a hybrid and it could do all these different things. So yeah, I think it made it easier, honestly, for them to pack and to program and clone from. It looks fantastic though. Um, and then ask your vendor if they can show you a demo of fixtures. Um, I've had some tours where I've seen, uh, in the design process, I've seen some uh, uh, like online demos and videos thinking, oh, this would be so cool. And then I see it in person and I realize it's not going to fit for the show. Uh, so integrating scenic. So if you have the opportunity to also kind of fit the production designer role, which, like I said, especially if you're just starting out and you're working with those newer artists or the artists who just kind of have you on their team, um, feel free to ask if you can expand on your lighting design and make it more production friendly. This was the first tour design I ever did. <laughs> um, we had very, very little money, uh, very little room in the trailer. Um, all that picture is is a white psych with four lights pointed on it. Um, and I was really proud of it when I did it because I realized I could take this small tour and make it look really big with just a couple lights and, and a screen. Um, so you can use these elements as canvases for lights, a couple lights on a backdrop go a long way. Um, so when choosing scenic materials and pieces, consider how light can alter it. So can it shine through, uplight it, reflect it, um, expose different textures depending on the angle. Maybe it's like a three-dimensional texture. Um, custom backdrops and set pieces and drum heads, rugs, stuff like that can add uniqueness to the show. So if you have any backline, and again, backline just means the instruments, um, if you have any backline that you're actually able to customize, um, it'll definitely keep that uniqueness to the show and it won't make it seem like a smaller production. So um, this could mean getting a custom drum head for the kick drum. Uh, you can tape the mic stands. Uh, get custom microphones, stuff like that. And it also means if you're customizing those pieces, you don't have to worry about that taking up part in your trailer because you're going to be using them anyway. Um, so now you have created some ideas and you want to uh, present them to your team. Um, so I have a template file in Photoshop. Um, you can use obviously whatever software you want to use. Um, but my template is to, uh, import and layout design ideas in a presentation. 
Um, so I basically have like a title page and a, a page at the end with like a wrap up. But in between those pages, I have like a set list. I'll have rendering ideas, drafting ideas. So it is in a way kind of like handing someone your final paperwork, your final drafting uh, for the rig, but also just professionally adding that touch to it and making it more look more presentable other than just some lines on paper. Um, so I have like a, a, a concept paragraph page where I talk about the artistic choices I've made, renderings showing partial and full integrity of the rig. And what I mean by that is um, it's tempting to show pictures of the rig doing all it can do, but also, you know, show how it can be, um, how you can take down the full integrity and maybe show those more isolated looks. Um, choose a couple songs to highlight. So maybe pick those two opposing songs like I was talking about earlier. Um, render out or, or you know, import your drafting into your 3D program. Do a couple looks for those songs and screenshot it and put those in there. Um, and if you have time, draft a truck pack. Vendor could also possibly do this for you too. Um, so send out your first ideas and drafts to your team as soon as you are comfortable with them. Um, too often have I been really unsure if I'm even proud of what I've done and I've kind of held out on sending these ideas right away. And it definitely bit me in the butt because I had less time later before the tour started to really um, to really narrow down my ideas and finally come up with a completed design. So just as soon as you have things that you're proud of, send it out right away. Um, uh, and depending on the situation, it could be a good idea to include photos and basic information of the fixtures you want to put in your design, um, just so the people approving the budget can get a better idea of what they're looking at on stage. Uh, I've had some uh, some artist managers tell me, you know, hey, we don't like low res looking strip lights on stage. And so I'll bring in a light that I don't think is a low res strip light. And they're like, oh, yeah, that could look good. And then the tour started and they were like, I'm a big fan. Um, so just try to gauge that. You know, sometimes like symbols on the plot can only get used so far. Um, and also there is an argument, it's more of a moral argument about the more you hand to your team, the more they have to fight back or to argue or to, you know, compromise with you about it. So, you know, it is kind of give and take, but I've always found it to be really good to put information on the lights I'm using because it reduces the struggle later for me. Um, so here's a template example of the um, of the document that I send out. So this is like the title page of the um, of the production design treatment. So this is a prelim treatment, as you can see in the title uh, that I did last December for the summer tour this year. That is sadly not happening. It has been postponed to next year. Um, but this is, you know, this is my title page. Um, I just have the date and the, the prelim. Uh, revision, which is, this was A, that's as far as we got before things turned for the worst. Um, these are kind of the, just the, the templates for all the following pages. So, you know, I make sure to put at the top center what it is we're looking at, and I just keep the consistencies of the title page on the outer corners. Um, so they always know if they're looking at a page, you know, what reference point it is. And then at the very end, I have a little end page with my contact information. Um, so, again, you know, you could just send renderings and stuff, but I really think this has helped me in the past gain trust and have people really see that I'm putting in the effort by professionally presenting it. And then, hopefully, you have created a final design. Um, so, you want to continue using that template file to fill in more information and more renders. Um, showing how your process has progressed will look super great to the client. So. Try to always grow it. This one was from last summer with Revolution. Thankfully, that tour did happen. Um, but you know, just just try to make it seem like you as well as the design have progressed. Um, and so now we'll get into um, scenarios. I know we have about 15 minutes left, so I'll try to shoot through these really fast. But just four quick design experiences I've had. Um, so I mentioned earlier that one photo was my first tour design experience ever. That was Jadena's Long Live the Chief tour in 2017. Um, so they did have creative directors and production designers, and I was the only person on the lighting team. Um, the requests from the team were to be able to accommodate moody, low-light looks, but also upbeat songs. Um, they wanted lots of haze. Uh, at the very top of the show, they wanted Jadena to come out and be silhouetted. 
which is where the site came into play. Um, limited amount of towers and flown lights to not block video walls. So if we have, if a venue had a video wall upstage, we liked to use it, even though we actually ended up never doing that. <laughs> the idea was that we'd use it if it was there, but we, ever, we never had a video wall. We sometimes would have iMac, um, but never a video wall upstage, so we never actually got to play around with that, sadly. Um, limited amount of ground fixtures to maximize dancing space. He was super, super active on stage um, and have fixtures dedicated to lighting props. So those are really just the major requests I had and the logistics I had to work with were one trailer for everything together, like backline, audio, everything. Um, the venues ranged from small, small clubs of like 150 people to theaters uh, with 6,000 people. So I had to create something that could expand. And it was, a, it was a fairly small budget spread over two months. Um, so how it resulted, I prioritized the request from the artist, so I prioritized the haze, um, the side lights, uh, which are for the dancing, and also the side lights were as far off stage as possible to maximize his performance space, and the prop lighting. Um, and I sent that to the vendor first to see how much more was left in the budget for the fun stuff. And there actually only ended up being 11 lights on the whole tour. Um, we rented that large white psych uh, to, uh, for a few reasons, to yes, to have the silhouette at the top of the show, but it ended up working out uh, because adding that scenic element really filled the space. And so when you're in these tiny spaces, it really expanded our stage out. And he also had some really awesome outfits with cool patterns he wore every day. And I realized too that the process, any way I can make him stand out more was really important. So having these uh, big blanketed colors on the psych um, opposing the colors of his outfit, you know, he could have like orange, yellow, white, crazy pattern, uh, traditional African sewn up and downs, which are really cool. You should look them up. You'll see them in the next slide. Um, having those uh, contrasting colors and complementary colors really helped him stand out for photos too. Um, we used road cases from backline to elevate the lighting upstage when we wanted to. Most of the lighting was just a, a few lights upstage as, so as to maximize performance space. Um, and then just two side lights on the side, some small LED parts for the props. You had some palm trees on stage. Um, and then I had four moving lights upstage with the musicians to fill in the gaps. So it was it's kind of like the perfect example of a first tour ever. Um, an amazing team to work with. I absolutely love working for this artist. He is uh, one down center in that photo. Um, so he's wearing more of a, just, he was wearing a solid color, but sometimes it was really cool pattern that just looked awesome with the psych. Um, so as you can see, the psych is working on the photo on the left with the silhouette, and that was just with white fabric and two lights. And you can see in the other photo, this was maybe one of the medium sized venues we would play, and we had, you can kind of see some palm trees up there. I didn't tend to get very good. Uh, get very good photos of this tour, sadly, so I can't show you most of the bigger picture. But I did have, um, I did program some house rig stuff when I was programming the tour, um, just so I could fill it out because I only had like four moving lights, two side lights, uh, two two psych lights, and um, just the LEDs for the the trees. I think it was just very very minimal, but a really really good introduction because it wasn't too much for me to worry about. And it looked pretty good every day. It was very consistent. I was able to expand it or contract it depending on the day. Um, so this was my second tour I ever designed a couple months later. Um, so Tegan and Sarah reached out to me. They were doing an acoustic tour uh, and they wanted a production and a lighting design. So now I'm getting thrown the production hat. Um, so the request from Tegan and Sarah, use lighting as an environmental supplement, not as the focal point of the show. Um, unlike the Jadena show where there were a lot of dancey, really, really fun songs and the lighting was used to, you know, make the audience want to be a part of the party. This one was more stripped down. We want to pay attention to just watching them in their static positions on stage. Um, pretty much no haze. Uh, story progression from full album into newer material. So meaning uh, they were doing a 10 year anniversary tour of the Khan album that came out in 2007. Real quick, sorry, I'm gonna let my dog in. <laughs> what? If you're gonna bark, come on in. Come on. Kind of love working from home. <laughs> um, so they were playing that album start to finish full, and then they added on uh, five songs at the end that were newer material, um, just to you know keep things fresh and kind of make the the younger fans happy who probably didn't know the album from 2007. 
Um, so they wanted to be fully illuminated and photographable throughout the whole show. Uh, and they also wanted to be on a riser and be elevated so they looked taller <laughs> because they're both about five foot one, I think. I should know this, I've known them forever. Um, and the two other musicians on stage were like, you know, six feet. Sorry about my dog barking, by the way. He's a puppy. Um, so the logistics that I had to work with for this tour, um, again, one trailer for everything, lights, backline, audio, uh, the same thing, venue sizes range from clubs to theaters, so the package must be able to expand. Um, and then I did have a really good budget actually spread over two months. Um, so the results for that tour, um, because I wanted them to feel more, uh, or I wanted the lighting to be more supplemental um, and not the bulk of the show, I decided to light scenic pieces and soft goods um, to accentuate the stage design and make it more of a filled out environment rather than party lights everywhere. Um, so what I did was uh, I created kind of some lighting pods for each person. So a few lights to surround each member just to give them a little bit of, you know, to help, to help them stand out from all the soft goods behind them. And the soft goods were nice too because they're really easy to pack up when they squish in the trailer nicely. So I didn't have to worry about overcrowding the trailer. Um, they would just squeeze in all of the different, uh, the different pockets. Um, the soft goods that I used, one of them was not custom and one of them was custom. And I had two layers of soft goods. Um, and I'll, I'll explain those in the pictures to come. Um, one of the soft goods was a star drop too. I was very excited about touring with the star drop. Um, so we did advance the risers at every venue. We didn't travel with risers, um, but because I knew risers at venues are usually super beat up, uh, I designed uh, some, uh, some lighting positions around the risers to kind of mask them every day. So we didn't have to worry about seeing ugly riser legs or whatever, and also just bring more attention to them in the middle of the room. Um, and I already said that they already got their own lights at their stations. So let me just show you pictures. Um, so my thought process with this is I really wanted to, again, uh, pay homage to the original album, uh, which came out in 2007. And in the album, if you bought the CD, if you bought the album book, uh, all these images that you see above them were in there. Um, so it was very, the aesthetic of the marketing at that time for that album uh, looked like a book, like you're flipping through pages of an old sketchbook. So I thought, okay, time has passed, 10 years have passed. How can we still, um, how can we still show the integrity of this album, uh, but also show how it's aged? And so I decided to take the images. Uh, these are not, these are the original sketches, but not the original color temperatures or shapes. Um, and what we did is we kind of, we cut them into these weird angles and had them floating uh, above, above the band by a means of sewing those appliques onto scrim. Uh, and scrim is just basically mesh, so black scrim. So, you know, as kind of the, 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 the natural breeze in the venues existed, um, they would look like these old pages from a book that were torn or angled or kind of floating above them. So it was kind of just the, the idea that the art is still holding on from that time um, and it's kind of making its way up. Uh, and then behind that, you can kind of see in this photo, there was that star drop. And I wanted to have dual layers to be able to just provide progression to the show. I didn't use a star drop right away. Um, you can also see the uh, lights on the riser skirting them. Uh, those were warm white uh, panel lights that worked super well. Um, they only did warm white, but that kind of helps with the whole aesthetic of the show. Uh, I, again, I wanted to kind of surround them and make them pop with the lighting, not have the lighting be the bulk of the show. Um, so here, here are some uh, pictures of the star drop in play. So basically, three quarters of the way through listening to the album start to finish, the, which is the first half of the show, we didn't use the star drop. I brought the star drop in about, again, a third, uh, three quarters of the way through behind the images, looked really cool. People, people's phones came out right away. Um, and it kind of stayed in or, you know, kind of faded in and out or twinkled and did some stuff until the album was done being played. And when the album was done being played and we were going on to the newer songs, we actually flew out the book images. So we played a lot of theaters that had line sets. 
So we did have one person in the local crew on headset with me. And, you know, as soon as I hit the last note of the last song of the album, we flew out the books to kind of to, to um, signify, hey, we're done playing the con. Now we're going to play some newer songs. If we had a venue where we couldn't fly it out, then we just didn't, you know, and they stayed in for the whole show. Um, but it was really nice and we could have that progression by having those two layers. Um, and the, the song everyone loved, um, I had 10 moving lights upstage, but I didn't really move them very much because it was so stripped down. I had them pretty much in a lot of static positions, uh, but just having them on the ground and being able to create that wall of light behind Tegan and Sarah really just encompassed them really nicely. And it did fill those bigger spaces when we did play spaces like the um, on the left is uh, the Ace Theater in downtown LA. I think the one on the right, uh, I think it's the House of Blues. Actually, I can't really tell. And I know it's somewhere on the East Coast, I think. Um, but it was a really easy way, you know, maybe if we had a super tall stage and all these short little musicians, you know, we were able to kind of build the line up between the lighting and the two levels of soft goods. And I'm going to shoot through these next couple, but I really wanted to talk about this one because it was an incredibly unique experience. And I'm not sure I'm going to have another one like this. Um, I got offered to design the Amanda Palmer tour last spring. Uh, I love Amanda Palmer. I have been a huge fan of hers for a long time. Also with Tegan and Sarah and Jordana, I've been really lucky to work with people that I have admired over the years. Um, but she presented a really unique opportunity to tour via plane and only do two to three shows a week. So weekend warrior shows, as we call them. Uh, but the only difference is that we were not shipping lighting between each place. We had to fly with the gear. And no, I did not fly with road cases. Um, we also had a very DIY budget. Um, we literally went over to her house and stayed there for four days and figured out how to design this show. Um, don't know if you'll ever have that opportunity. I took full advantage of it. It was pretty fun. Um, so, and I already asked them, so it was okay to say it like that too. It was, we, we recognized it was a very DIY low budget tour. Um, but she had a bunch of crazy requests. So she, she played the piano during the show for every song, except for two, she played the ukulele. Uh, she wanted to light the inside of a piano for a specific moment in one song where she leans into it and she wanted her face to be lit up and nothing else. Uh, she wanted four set pieces, a rug, a lamp, a table, and a mirror ball. Um, beauty is humanly possible for most of the show, but then she also sang two Disney covers, so she wanted to make it as flashy as humanly possible. Um, and she wanted a few hundred lights to represent stories submitted by her fans, meaning she wanted a bunch of light, lights on stage somehow, and each light would represent a story, but there were hundreds of stories that she was referencing. So that was really confusing for me at first. Um, so we had to fly to each venue. So I literally had to carry the lighting with me between each venue. It was one of the biggest confines. Um, and the scenic elements, like those props I mentioned, actually were sourced through her Patreon patrons. So I created a Google form for that to have her fans submit to me what they could bring for that show. And at the start of Loden, I would meet her fans backstage give them backstage passes so they could hang out with her as to say thank you for lending us things like a leg lamp or a rug or something. It was, it was hilarious. I got to meet so many great people. But the picture of Amanda in the middle with two of her fans who, uh, who lent a leg lamp for the show. Um, so the light, the hundreds of lights on stage, I ended up just using festoons, of course, because uh, now that I've learned they're very easy to travel with if you bubble wrap them really well and they fit into suitcases. Um, and I had just a couple hue lights for inside the piano. I went with hue lights because they're LED and I could just put them on a dimmer and just pop them on for the moment and pop them back off. It was way easier than trying to fit a really small light in there via DMX because we weren't even really traveling with a cable package and it was rare that the venues we were at had spare DMX lines. So I literally was just asking like, hey, do you have a spare dimmer and an extension cable? I'm gonna plug this light in and put it in the piano. <laughs> um, a lot of the venues we played were theaters without intelligent rigs, so full hundreds of Lico's above us. So I had to advance gel, uh, lighting positions. I was basically focusing a theater show every single day, it, which made me realize I'd never want to tour a theater show. But it was a really, really fun challenge. Um, everything I traveled with packed up into four suitcases, and 
that's including my command wing because we didn't have room to travel with a full console, nor did we really need one. So I had an MA2 command wing in a Peloton case I traveled with quite the experience. Um, I also, when I was presenting her the design, Amanda, she's, I, I asked her, I was like, how do I describe you? You know, she's not a lines on paper person. She's not a, she can't really look at drafting and see what she's going to have on the stage. So I put it into Photoshop because I knew that that would please her more if she could see on a more realistic level what we could accomplish on stage. So the design for this ended up being, um, it went through a few iterations, but when I was chatting with Amanda, I, I just kept getting this intention from her that she wanted to create a comforting experience for her in the audience because it was a long show. She did a lot of storytelling, and a lot of the stories and the content were really, really sad, very depressing, very real, very raw. Um, so I knew from the get-go that the show had to be comforting. I didn't want the audience to not feel like they were not allowed in the space. So we were sitting in her living room talking about this, and I felt just very comfortable, like I'm just sitting in, in her living room with her having this conversation, and I realized I should try to bring that to the stage. I want the audience to feel like they're having a very intimate moment with Amanda. So I just designed uh, very simply some bay windows. Um, there were some ivy upstage of it. We actually ended up not touring with the ivy, but we did have the windows, and the windows were um, were soft goods that we hung up with cool posts. They were not actual wood. Um, we ended up not touring with those letters. We were going to hang letters on the stage, um, but we did have the area rugs, the the lighting, uh, the lamp, some other stuff like that. So this was kind of like the first um, idea I had that I pitched to her. And it ended up being way more simple, and ended up just looking like this. She she ended up seeing the festoons, and she was like, I love it. It's simple. I just want to hang them all, just hang them from the ceiling in whatever which way. I don't want them to look like intentional. I want them to be trashy, just thrown up there, which, you know, as a designer, you're like, ah, what do you mean? <laughs> Asymmetry and doing things without intention. <laughs> but you know, I had to get used to it. You know, every day I hung the lights up in a different way. Um, and the final, pro you know, I didn't really get good photos of this one either, but the final product, you can barely see behind her in this shot, um, the windows. We did end up having the windows around her, um, and I would have the lights from the grid that I would focus shine through the windows depending on the song. If it was a more somber song, it would be more of like a cool tone, um, like it was raining outside. I also had some lights hidden in the wings that would shine on her um, at super low angles that you really weren't expecting depending. So I just kind of live bust intensities and angles. Um, and the festoons, we started off by hanging them and having them drip down onto the stage. I had the idea of having the festoons kind of creep into the audience to try to bring them into the stage with her, but we ended up realizing probably not the best idea. I think someone stepped on them once, so we nixed that really fast. But um, And here's a, a, not the best image of the light inside the piano for this one moment where she leans in and she starts to sing. Um, very powerful moment, and it was really, really, um, it was all her idea, and it was a really good indication of how you can do some really cool stuff with not a lot of money. So. I'll, I'll forever hold that tour dear to my heart. It was five months of weekend warriors and lugging four suitcases, and I wouldn't trade it for a thing. Um, so I'll talk about my last one. Sorry, this took a bit. I know we'll get to questions soon. Um, so this is my first so far and only arena amphitheater bus tour experience with Revolution last summer. Um, so the team for this uh, didn't really exist. There was no creative team, but the manager was kind of the liaison between the band. The band really wanted to be involved. So it was just me and my co-designer, Spencer Michaels. Um, that we also co-designed, co-programmed, and then I was the lighting director on the tour. I, I um, operated it every day. I also had a head rigger slash crew chief and a laser programmer, programmer and director. So I designed where the lasers went, but we also had um, Josh who programmed the lasers and ran them. So we had a few other um, pretty easy requests in the grand scheme of things. This one was kind of fun though. The bassist came up to me. He's kind of maybe like the lead um, creative of the band. He goes, I really want crazy EDM style light show uh, when we need it for crazy songs, but also, you know, when it's a chill song, let's get a relaxing environment going. So I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. Um, so the singer downstage is not like Hayes, anywhere near him. So we had to 
kind of persuade the haze somehow to stay upstage and you know eventually put most of the lighting upstage so we could see it all up there away from him so he could have a show if he could perform his show well um they liked having backdrops just historically they love having backdrops so we had to design one and choose a material for it that could withstand wind and all the outside venues because 95 percent of the venues we played were outside um keep lights out of the audience's eyes as much as possible they did not like seeing lights in the audience's eyes blinders were fine they do a lot of back and forth with the crowd they want to see the crowd when they're talking to them but not pointing like beams or anything super uh super bright um this is the band that didn't like strip lights <laughs> no strip lights in the rig um and then make sure we can light the stage with gobos um to give the audience up high something fun to look down on we played a lot of amphitheaters um, and this tour we did have the opportunity to uh, design a lot of flown lighting so they really like it when the lights can point down on the stage get all these cool patterns and the people up high in the amphitheater can look down on something cool um, we had to artistically integrate cryo and lasers first time for me touring with cryo and lasers um, and then they also liked being lit from the front at all times for photos except for transitional uh, transitions in between songs um, so I had to create a, a system of front light that could accommodate the whole stage. Uh, and we were only allowed at half of a semi of trailer space, which we ended up giving a whole semi, which was great. Um, and we had to leave room in the budget to allow purchasing of a new set of six cryo tanks for every show. So again, shooting with the budget really came in handy. Um, so the results, um, when we were collaborating on the design, we were looking at pictures of their past advertisements for their tours, and they always have a different a different theme every year. Um, last year it was coastal mountains. This year is um, Joshua Tree, more like desert. But we noticed that every year they kind of have a different approach to their marketing, and so we really wanted to try to um, extend the coastal mountain idea onto the stage, uh, also because they're based out of Santa Barbara, and we knew how important that was to them, to kind of bring a little bit of home into it um so we created trust in the shape of big triangles aka mountains um to satisfy that more organic um chill look and then we but we lined them with a ton of hybrid fixtures to satisfy the option for an edm light show um inside the triangles we put metal mesh which is a so what fabric um it's just window screen that's been crumpled that you can light from underneath and it adds a lot of texture so we added that in the middle of the trust triangles to um, kind of further the idea that there are mountains and create an organic texture. Um, all the cryo and atmosphere was placed upstage to hopefully point leading into the singer's performance space. Um, super hard for me. I like when cryo is kind of like downstage, upstage, all over. That way you can have different options. Um, but we ended up doing just a row in the, in the back, actually upstage of the band, and that way we were able to get, um, you know, maybe we didn't get the up, down, but we got the left, right, which was good, or the in out. Um, so the backdrop we designed in grayscale because we wanted it to take color from lighting. And the background, or uh, sorry, the backdrop was super simple as far as design goes, just super geometric uh, grayscale mountain range to kind of match the, the geometry of the truss. Um, and the same lights that were uplighting the, the triangle mesh in the middle were lighting the backdrop in the back. And we could kind of, you know, that way we'd create different levels of, you know, sky, mountain, whatever. Um, and the position of the lights I thought was super unique. I had never seen positions like this. So um, they could be super diverse and we could also divert them from hitting the audience's eyes. So here is um, kind of just the bang, boom, pow version <laughs> of the or photo that you can kind of take a look at. Um, so I don't know if it's super easy to tell, but we had a big triangle in the middle and two smaller triangles, vertical truss triangles on the outside. I wanted to show this first just to get an idea of how many lights we had. Um, the backdrop you can barely see upstage in this one because everything downstage is kind of dominating it. But we only had seven lasers, uh, one on the top of each mountaintop, and then two downstage and then two upstage of the, um, of the drummer in the middle. Uh, we had their risers that they were like, they did not want to budge on their risers, the, the riser configuration they've been using for years. Um, we had some lights lining the risers in the back just to kind of have the musicians pop out. Um, and we were able to accomplish a lot of really cool looks with everything we had. So here's one 
huge lip where all the lights are honestly just tilted inward and I thought it was pretty cool, kind of like a zipper. Um, here's a better look of uh, the just the triangular structures. Um, we also had an R in the middle, which is the, the Revolution R. We wanted that front and center. Um, so that was actually a, a, an applique on some scrim downstage of the metal mesh. So you can kind of see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, no. Um, but you can see the blue metal mesh working its magic. That's just up light on the metal mesh uh, in that middle triangle. This was at Red Rocks in Colorado. Uh, this shot did not show the best haze, <laughs> um, but I kind of liked it because you could see our intentions with our lights that we had flown in the rig, which you can see in the top corners. Um, for Red Rocks, we had updated the positions to light um, the rocks instead of the stage. We would, or sometimes we would do half and half or just the stage, but usually those were the patterns that we would have on the stage that like they wanted for the people who are in the very, very back and see something cool. Um, so, and you can kind of see the lasers doing their magic on the bottom of it. You can actually see the beam. So, it's a sad day for Hayes. Um, and here you can see the backdrop a little bit more. Um, adding that grayscale from black to white helped with uh, just kind of the illusion of actually looking at a horizon, added a ton of depth to the stage. We had a lot of the stages uh, that we performed on were pretty wide, but surprisingly not very deep for what we needed. And, and I don't know if you can tell, but their risers, the way they wanted their risers was kind of weird. They always had the outer ones angled, and they had a, a, a catwalk in the middle, we called it, for the two horn players to walk across, and then we had the drummer upstage. So, yeah, here's just a few images of how that one came to be, and I think that's it. So, thanks for listening to me ramble way too long about stuff. This one was a little hard for me because the right brain is a challenge, so. All <laughs> right, we have some questions for you. Great. Okay, so the first one is, does it count as fire curtains if the shell fabric is treated for five, for fire? Um, honestly, I've run into it both ways. It really depends on the venue. Um, most of the time, yes. Uh, you really just shouldn't put anything on the stage in line with the fire curtain. Um, usually with the shows I design, I there have only been a few shows where I've had downstage fixtures, um, like like downstage up lights pointing into the to the artist. Um, but those have never really been in the way. It's mostly like the monitors. If you have like monitor wedges on stage for the for the artist to hear themselves, um, sometimes you have to kind of get created in where they end up. But usually the fire curtain is either on the very 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 edge of the stage or in line with the very edge, or somewhere within a few feet of it. But it can definitely get in the way if you have lights sitting in the downstage, but it's best to just ask. All right, the next one says, hey, Lauren, I'm loving all these tips for planning the logistics up front. I love planning, but I'm really slow at it, especially when I have to be very specific. Do you have any tips for speeding up the planning process? Ooh, um, well, templates are good. Um, I have a template uh, venue breakdown sheet where it just has columns labeled like, venue, city, uh, dimensions, rigging capabilities, all that stuff. Um, I just know that if I have a template, I am way quicker at getting excited to fill it in. Um, I am also a huge fan of spreadsheets. <laughs> um, so just kind of being able to, to, to not start from scratch is what takes off more time than you think. Um, and it also, as you start to build these templates and these sheets, you'll learn what you're going to need consecutively throughout the processes. And not that every process is going to be the same, but for the most part, you are going to need things like city dimensions, all that stuff. Um, you can have a clear head with approaching each line of that spreadsheet. So um, instead of thinking like, oh, what do I need from this? Just add it in the notes at the end. Just fill in all that you need way quicker that way. Um, other than that, I just got to get caffeinated and get in the mood. <laughs> All right, next question is asking, did you work as a lighting crew member on tours before you were a designer? Um, yes. Yeah, so my, um, it's like kind of yes and no. I, the first tour I was ever on was the Ingrid Michelson tour in 2016, and it was designed by Early Bird Visual and programmed by one of the partners of that company, Eric Marchwinski. So I sat with him through the rehearsal week and watched him program the whole show. 
but I have no creative control prior to that moment. I showed up to just watch it, then I learned how to pack it all up and run the show. Um, so I, I was given a really awesome opportunity to watch that process first. But then, yes, the second tour I ever did, I was actually designing it, which um, kind of just worked out miraculously. After the Ingrid tour, I, uh, or before and after the Ingrid tour, I was covering for a lot of other LDs that I had met um, through email or just networking or whatever, saying like, hey, I know you want to get involved in the industry. Um, here's an artist. They're, they're doing like a 4 p.m. set at a festival. Uh, do you want to just cover me for the show? And so that way I kind of created my relationships with different artists and different um, different management companies who knew about me. And I continued to run other people's shows or just punted artists. And then I ran the Ingrid tour, continued to do that. And eventually uh, covering for enough Janelle Monet shows, Janelle Monet was like, hey, I have an artist on my label uh, who's doing a tour, can you help them out? So um, it really helps to just be involved as much as you can to finally get that first design opportunity. I feel very lucky that mine was like not even a year and a half after my first real show. Um, but yes, I was very, very happy that I actually only had, uh, I only had to worry about the, the, the crew chiefing and the logistics of a tour before doing the design process. I think I would have been super overwhelmed. All right, next question. You mentioned emergency funds in a budget. What is a reasonable percentage of the main budget that should be considered for emergencies? Um, so I, oh, that's a hard one. I always try to shoot for 80% of the budget, which is actually quite a bit less than the full budget, but that's because I'm still learning what things cost. I have a good idea at this point, but for many times I've actually uh, approached trying to, um, trying to utilize 80% and it ended up coming back from the vendor at like 95%. Um, so it's good to shoot low uh, if you don't have a lot of time, but I've also been in situations where I've had a tour not starting for about eight months. And so it, it, it offered me the opportunity to actually shoot pretty high because we all know it's a little easier to pull back. Um, so I always try to shoot for 80, but it really depends on what you think your daily costs are going to be or your emergency costs are going to be. Because there are obvious things like, hey, well, either we're gonna travel with a bunch of haze or we're gonna need to buy more haze or maybe some more lamps for our lights. Um, but the Revolution design was a really good intro to that because I had to see how much cryo costed because we needed to order six tanks of cryo every day, which was about $1,000. So I knew from the get-go, I had to look at how many shows you're we doing, times that by a thousand, subtract that from the budget, and then maybe go a little bit lower. So it's really good to ask around first and see if there are any elements you need to prioritize. All right, next question. Any more tips on effective networking methods and how to build a client base in the digital age? Yeah, um, <laughs> the first thing I'll say is just uh, listen um, and, and just be open. Uh, and be kind. Seems really simple, but I <laughs> I was really skittish when I started meeting people because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I probably looked really underprepared and uh, I think it rubbed off on a few people. Um, the first show I ever covered was a festival for Janelle. Had zero idea what to expect, had never done a festival never ran lights for a musical artist. Uh, all I knew is I was getting on a plane and showing up and punching on a house rig uh, or on a festival rig. Um, so I was kind of just thrown into learning departments, learning different people. I totally undermined the position of my festival LD, had no idea really what its job was. Um, so if you don't know anything, the best thing is just to ask. So getting started just, really, really let the people that you're working with or working under um, know that you are interested in who they are. Because the more I realize, like, I'm, like, maybe I was scared in the beginning to open up to those people, but the more I gave them time of day and the more I was interested in how they were going about their career and what they did and picking their brains on, um, just on their, on their jobs and how they came to be, you know, one, everyone likes attention like that, you know, everyone wants to tell their story. 
but also it shows that you're genuinely curious about how things work and 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 um and just like expressing your curiosity makes people curious in you um i also tend to send follow-up emails every once in a while to people that i've met um i try to make every interaction i can very memorable i you have to remember that the people that we're working with are people they're not all machines um so you don't you know i used to be super super nervous about talking to people and i do a time learn on the ld by um but the more that i created kind of a, a personal relationship with people it reminded them that we are all human and it made them want to create a better relationship with me so um and i know that's more of an in-person approach um but digitally it's super important just to keep up with your friends um you know maybe let them know your offering uh or maybe you know every once in a while too i'll, I'll just be like hey guys like i'm free for a couple of months if you guys need anything anyone to cover or hey are you doing anything for this event or can i meet up with you at this conference or whatever um reminding people that you're there is really important we meet a lot of people a lot of people and even if you don't see them for years physically see them digitally seeing them works just as well all right next question is asking what is your favorite console to work on or which one do you usually use and what are some good ways to learn and experiment with programming and designing the light show Hi, so I am primarily an MA2 programmer. Um, I do know enough to get by on some other consoles, not as well as the MA, um, but I found it's really important to know a little bit of everything because you never know if you're going to walk into a venue where you have to um, network in through their console or use their console for certain parts of the rig or whatever I've definitely run into. Or, or my favorite is when you go overseas and they're like, what's an MA? I have this knockoff thing. <laughs> um, you know, you, you kind of have to be on your stuff. But um, what was the second half of that question again? Sorry? Um, it was asking, what are some good ways to learn and experiment with programming and designing the light show? Got it, got it, got it. Um, so just look at what software you have available to download. Um, I know that our our industry is full of really expensive softwares. Um, don't think you need every fancy bell and whistle to um, to be a good designer, especially when you're learning out, uh, when you're starting to learn. When you know when you develop a client base and a career over a few years, then yes, you can experiment with other softwares. But it's okay to not feel the pressure to know everything and just use what you can at your fingertips and what's good for your financial financial situation. Um, what I did to start learning, hilariously enough, I was so uh, just, I had no idea how to attack 3D programs. So I actually Photoshopped lights and like light beams and output in Photoshop um, before I could do a 3D program because it was the only way I quickly was familiar with and knew how to get across what I wanted to see. Um, so I think with designing, it's more important to start with what's familiar and comfortable to you, and then you can grow your software knowledge after. But also note that there are a lot of free tutorials and free softwares out there to get you started. All right, we have another question. What are your thoughts on utilizing follow spots? Oh, so I actually use follow spots all the time in my tours. Um, the one thing I've learned is just it's most important to know how many you have and to prepare for one to die or to prepare to have a backup and to get your gel right, your gel colors right. Um, I actually use, I've used follow spots in most of my tours. Um, I like using follow spots when I'm running a time-coded show. I absolutely hate running follow spots while also manually running a show. My brain overheats and I get very annoyed. <laughs> um, uh, I like the idea. I think it's a great way to um, to kind of hone in on your artist if they need that kind of isolation for a song. Um, if you think you won't need it for most of the show, then maybe that's where you just um, pre-program more of an isolated spot look in your house rig or in your front light truss because um, they are they are an expensive thing to to budget out for your shows because not only are you renting that gear from the venue um, I've never actually personally traveled with all spots I've only ever sourced them from the venues um, but you're also paying for the time of the operators 
So um, it's kind of up to you and your budget to see if you want to use it. But if you have an artist that moves around heavily on stage and you can afford to to um, rent it, I would definitely utilize it. All right, looks like we have a couple more questions. Um, when pitching your ideas to a client before being hired, do you charge for your concepts and time to prepare the pitch? I do, yeah. Um, so I've actually only had one uh, experience where it was kind of between me and another person um, for the design bid. Usually I've just been approached saying like, hey, you're the designer, show us what you can do. And thankfully I did a good enough job to where they wanted to keep me. Um, and in the other the other experience, um, I was I was chosen over the other designer, so I feel very lucky there. Um, but I, I do, I mean, of course I try to not make my time and efforts all about money as far as conversation goes, I think I've kind of perfected, you know, expressing my interest and my excitement first before saying like, oh, hey, you want my time, here's my budget. Um, I think at the end of the day, whoever's hiring you is gonna be way more excited that you're actually interested in the project. Um, so yeah, so I will. And it also just really depends on how much they wanna see. If they're, especially if they're bidding my time and they want me to present a full design that they might not even use, I'm gonna charge them for a full design package, um, maybe a little less, but usually close to or at the number I would charge for a design that would get actually produced and presented. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, how important do you believe where you live is to the development of your career? Well, um, to the development, I would say pretty important. Um, that's why I, as you can see, I live in a cabin. <laughs> I recently moved um, to the woods because I knew that my year was gonna be full of touring. Sadly, of course, it is not full of touring right now, but um, I was thinking, oh, I'll have a cool place to come home to because I can see that I am booked through December. Um, I think it's really important to be available right then and there. Um, I don't wanna say there are specific cities that are uh, more fruitful than others because I have a lot of friends who live in maybe the less of the major cities, like my hometown is Phoenix, Arizona. Um, tons of productions going out. Yeah, they may not have the, um, the types of studios and venues that LA has or Chicago has or something, but there's still lots of opportunities and being close to the action is important not only to be readily available um, just for, for your gigs, but also to be readily available to pick up work last minute. Um, I, I lived in LA the last seven years before I moved here, and I'm only two and a half hours away from the city now. Um, so if I really need to go down, I will. Uh, but, but living there was nice because sometimes I'd wake up on a Sunday at like eight in the morning and I'll get a call saying like, hey, there's this really, really awesome show happening at the Universal lot and I really need a second programmer. Can you come? Here's the, Here's your pay. Uh, and, you know, it's those kinds of opportunities I've been really thankful for. I've done so many last minute gigs. And I think it's because, you know, I'm still early in my career. And people who are running those shows usually are, you know, they have more experience than me. They've been doing it all longer than me. But there are also times where those people sometimes have an emergency last minute or something goes wrong or they just can't make it or whatever the reason being. And, I'm, you know, and all the other people that are really good are booked. So, you know, that's when I would come in and that's kind of how I started to build my relationships with different places and uh, was just having the ability to be available. Um, and also it's just convenient. Um, you want to live closer to shops too, because that way you can be involved in more demos, dem like demonstrations. And if you really need to use a console, you know, you can hit them up and say, hey, I'm trying to learn this thing. Can I borrow this for half a day or come sit in for half a day? Um, having the resources readily available is super important. So I say, you know, once you think you can kind of suss out your year, then maybe you can move to the woods too. <laughs> but I think being close with the action is really important. Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much, Lauren. Um, if you are wanting to reach out to Lauren, her contact information is up on the screen right now. Um, sounds like you're open to getting questions from people. Yeah, super open. Like seriously, reach out anytime. I'm here to talk, so. All right, wonderful. Yeah. Before we end, I'm gonna throw a couple of links into the chat box for everyone. So the first link is to our um, full training calendar. 
or I'm sorry, the first link is to, yeah, to the full training calendar um, and Harmon Professional University's information. And then the second link is to the recorded sessions that we have it on YouTube. So we get asked that question all the time, where can I access the recording? This session will be put out onto the channel um, in two to three days. So if you wanted to rewatch anything um, or catch any of the other sessions, that's available on there. So all three of the resource links are up in chat. And Lauren, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to have you presenting. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thanks everyone and Martin. You guys are awesome. It's been thanks. so fun. Have a great day, everyone. Thank yeah. you, Lauren. Great job. Thanks, Brad.